We're all familiar with the quadratic formula. I give you any quadratic equation, you put the coefficients in, and it gives you your two solutions back out again. But what if I gave you a random cubic equation or a random quartic equation? Would you be able to tell me the solutions? Well, unless it's a particularly neat nice one where the solutions are obvious, you probably wouldn't be. But it is actually always possible to find solutions. And I'll be showing you how to do this in this video. You might have seen a way to get the quadratic formula by doing something called completing the square, but I'm going to show you a different way in this video, which is going to apply much more easily to cubics and quartics. So here's the graph of a general quadratic, and the key is to notice this blue line of symmetry right here. Every quadratic has a line of symmetry like this. Now, if only I could shift the entire quadratic to the left, so that this line of symmetry was on the y-axis, we would have something called an even function. An even function is a function that has a line of symmetry on the y-axis, or more precisely, it's a function where f of x equals f of negative x for every value of x. And the important fact about even functions that we're going to be using is that even functions have only got even powers of x. So for example, our quadratic equation can have an x squared term and a constant term, but it can't have an x term. Meaning the function of this graph right here will have an equation of f of x equals px squared plus q. And if this thing was equal to zero, it would be quite easy to solve a quadratic like that. And the idea of depressing the quadratic, this is called a depressed quadratic by the way, is to turn any quadratic into one that looks like this, which is easy to solve, and then we'll be able to solve the original one. Okay, so how exactly do we do that? Let's go back to the original quadratic we had before. And we have this line of symmetry, which always passes through this red point right here, which is called the vertex. The vertex is just the minimum or maximum point of the quadratic curve. In this case, it's the minimum. And you can find this vertex either by completing the square and finding which value of x minimizes or maximizes the expression. Or if you know a little bit of calculus, the vertex is the point where the derivative of the function is zero. Either way that you work it out, it turns out that the vertex has coordinates negative b over 2a. That's the x coordinates of the vertex. So if we want to shift this whole thing to the left, we're going to use the substitution x prime equals x plus b over 2a. And so the idea is if we applied this substitution, instead of plotting y against x, we plot y against x prime, then that should give us our graph from before, which was an even function, which will be easy to solve. So if everything goes well, when we apply this substitution to our general quadratic equation, ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero, we should end up with an equation with an x prime squared and a constant term, but there should be no x prime term by its own. The x prime term is now gone, which is good because it means that we have a depressed quadratic, which is easy to solve. We just rearrange by making x prime the subject. This looks familiar, but we don't want x prime, we want x, which was the solutions to our original quadratic. And x equals x prime minus b over 2a. So we just subtract b over 2a from this. And voila, there it is, the quadratic formula by depressing the quadratic. I'll show you next how we can depress any polynomial. I'll focus on cubics and the quartics, but the pattern should become pretty obvious. This is a general cubic equation. If the leading coefficient was not one, then we could just divide by the leading coefficient to get an equation that looks like this. We can just assume that the leading coefficient is one. We'll use a similar trick to what we did with the quadratic to depress this cubic, which means get rid of the x squared term. So here's the graph of a general cubic equation. Now, unlike the quadratic, there is no line of symmetry here that we can draw, but there is a different kind of symmetry, which is a rotational symmetry about this point right here. We can rotate it 180 degrees about that point, 
and it's the same place as where it started. Now this purple point is called the point of inflection, and for those of you familiar with calculus, if you're not, don't worry, just go with it for now. This point is where the second derivative is equal to zero, and it turns out to have the coordinates of x equals negative b over 3a. So if we want to shift this to the left, so that that point of inflection is on the y-axis, we want to use a substitution x prime equals x plus b over 3a. This is quite similar to what we were doing before with the quadratic case. Instead of b over 2, we have b over 3. When we did this with the quadratic, we ended up with an even function. An odd function is one where f of negative x equals negative f of x. And odd functions have a rotational symmetry of 180 degrees about the origin. They only have odd powers of x. So there's going to be no x squared term and there's going to be no constant term. This graph right here is not an odd function because it doesn't have rotational symmetry about the origin which is that orange point right there. If we wanted an odd function, we could shift this entire thing down to be sitting on that point. This is an odd function, but what we actually have wasn't that, it was this, which is just that odd function plus some constant. So what all this means is after we apply this substitution down here, x prime equals x plus b over three, we should hopefully end up with some odd function plus a constant, which means it might have x cubed terms, it might have x terms, it might have a constant term, but it won't have an x squared term, which is what we wanted. And that's called a depressed cubic. So if we apply this substitution right here to our general cubic equation, hopefully the x squared term will disappear. And as we can see, there is no x prime squared term. This is a depressed cubic. We can make this look a bit simpler if we just call the things in the brackets p and q. We now have a cubic equation with no x squared term. This is a depressed cubic. It's still not entirely clear how we do solve something like this, but certainly seems like it will be easier. We'll talk a little bit later in the next section about how we can solve a general depressed cubic. Before we do that, I'll talk about how we can depress a quartic equation. So here's the equation of a general quartic, again, as before, we can assume that the leading coefficient is 1. And the graph of a general quartic might look something like this. Uh, there's no clear symmetries here, no line of symmetry, no rotational symmetry. So we can't really do all the business we did earlier with even and on functions. Luckily, there was quite a clear pattern with the substitution we were doing. We had x plus b over 2, x plus b over 3. It seems like x prime equals x plus b over 4 would be quite a reasonable choice to go with here. So if we just try that and see what happens, indeed, if you put this into the equation at the top, we do end up with the x cube term vanishes and we get some p, q and r, which if you expanded it all out, you'd be able to write in terms of b, c, d and e. This is called a depressed quartic. And again, if you can solve this, you can just undo your substitution and solve any quartic you like. Our depressed cubic was of this form. If we can solve this, we can solve any cubic whatsoever. The way to do this is easy to understand, but very, very clever. Consider u plus v all cubed. This might seem like it comes out of nowhere, but trust me, this works out very nicely. Expand this out, we get u cubed plus 3u squared v plus 3uv squared plus v cubed. We're going to factor out a 3uv from those middle two terms, like this, and okay. Then we finally move everything to one side. And now, if you haven't seen how this is related to our depressed cubic, maybe pause the video, have a look at this for a moment, and see if you can realize what the connection is. If we let u plus v equal x, well, this is just a depressed cubic. Now, this equation here, the one in the middle of the screen, is always true for any values of u and v as long as x equals u plus 3. So what we want to do is find out for which values of u and v is this cubic at the bottom equal to the cubic at the top right. That is, we want minus 3uv equal to p and minus u cubed plus v cubed equal to q. So we have these two simultaneous equations right here. I'm just going to cube the middle one 
so that we have u cubed v cubed equals minus v cubed over 27. And the reason I've done that is because now I have two numbers. If I multiply them together, I get minus p cubed over 27. And if I add them together, I get minus q. And those two numbers are u cubed and v cubed. So the question is, how can I find those two numbers given that I know what they add to and I know what they multiply to? There's two ways you could think about this. The first way is to just brute force it. You rearrange the third equation to make u cube the subject. You substitute it into the second one and you get a quadratic equation and you solve it. That's one way we could do it. There's another way, which is the same thing. It gives you the same equation, but I think it's a little bit more elegant in the way that we think about it. And that's to think about u cubed and v cubed as being the roots of this quadratic right, right here. So why is that the case? Well, because if you take the roots of any quadratic, alpha and beta, they multiply to make the constant term, alpha, beta, and they add to make the negative of the coefficient of z, which is negative alpha plus beta. So in this case, they add together to make negative q, so the coefficient of z would be q, and they multiply to make negative p cubed over 27, meaning the constant term is negative p cubed over 27. We want to solve this quadratic right here, which we can easily do with the quadratic formula. These are our u cubed and v cubed. We can then cube root those to get u and v. And finally, we want x, which equals u plus v. So if we take one of them as being the negative root and one of them as being the positive root, and adding them together, we get x. And this is the general solution to any depressed cubic equation. Now, if our original cubic was not depressed, we would need to give p and q in terms of b, z, and d. Because of the substitution, this would also be x prime and not x. What I have written on screen is essentially the cubic formula, which you can use to solve any cubic whatsoever. Now, you might be wondering, what about the other two roots? Because this formula right here seems like it only gives you one root of your cubic, so where are the other two? The answer lies with complex numbers and the cube roots we've got here. If you're unfamiliar with complex numbers, then don't worry if you don't understand what I say next. So I'm going to let omega equal e to the 2 pi i over 3, which is a non-real cube root of 1. And then we can multiply or divide any real cube roots by omega to get one of the complex roots. This means we can get more solutions by multiplying and dividing the cube roots in this formula by these omegas. If we multiply the left form by omega, we must divide the right one by omega and vice versa. And the reason for this is because when we multiply u and v, because these both represent u and v, if we multiply them together, we need to get negative p over 3, which is a real number, meaning the omegas need to cancel out. So if you're unfamiliar with complex numbers, then don't worry too much if you didn't understand the last part. What you could do is you could just find the real roots and then do some algebraic division to find a quadratic which has the other two roots and then solve that using the quadratic formula. Actually, using this formula is completely impractical and you wouldn't really ever do it for any practical reason, but it's still cool that we know, at least in theory, that we could. Another thing worth mentioning about the cubic formula is that even if you're only trying to find the real roots, you may be forced to deal with complex numbers along the way. And this was what forced mathematicians in the first place to actually finally accept complex numbers because there was no way around the fact that complex numbers had to be used in this formula if q squared plus 4p cubed over 27, which is the thing inside the square root, is negative, you need to use complex numbers along the way, even if the final answer ends up just being a real number. If we can solve a depressed quartic, we can solve any quartic. Solving a depressed quadratic was easy. Solving a depressed cubic was a little bit more difficult. We had to notice the e plus v cubed trick. What we're going to do is we're going to use something called Ferrari's method. The other Ferrari, this guy. And the idea is we're going to assume that this depressed quartic right here can be factorized into the product of two quadratics like this. So we assume that this equation here is true and we need to work out what these two quadratics are. Each of these quadratics is going to have two roots. That's the total of four roots, which are the four roots of our depressed quartic. We need to find S, T, U, and V. And if we can do that, then we will have, at least in theory, a general quartic formula. Let's expand out the brackets, equate the coefficients. So we now have this system of four equations and four unknowns. If we can solve these four equations for these four unknowns, S, T, U, and V, then 
we have, at least in theory, got a general quartic formula. Okay, so if we can solve this, we're basically done. The first equation becomes u equals minus s. We can then put that into the second and third equations. Okay, then I'm going to take the second and third equations. I'm going to multiply those by v. Because now I know that tv equals r from the fourth equation. And now I have the middle two equations, which have two unknowns, v and s. Okay, so I'm just going to rearrange these a little bit to make it more clear that these are quadratics in v. And now I'm going to take the second equation and multiply it by s so that they both have that s v squared at the front. And finally, I'm going to subtract the third equation from the second one, which does this. Okay, I promise we're almost done. This is looking very messy. The second equation can be easily rearranged to make v the subject. And finally, I'm going to substitute this into the third equation. Now, this becomes quite messy. You can do the algebra yourself. But what we end up with is this expression right here. Okay, I know. It's getting quite long. And this doesn't really look much better because now we have a sextic equation, which is one where the highest power of s is 6. The only powers of s are even. So this is basically a cubic equation where the roots are s squared. Because we have a cubic formula, we can, at least in theory, always solve a, an equation like this. So that means that we can find s squared and then we can find s. So we can always find s. Okay, now that we know we can always find s, we can use that in the second and first equations to always find u and v, and then put that into the last equation to find the value of t. And then finally, the roots of our depressed quartic equation, which is what we were trying to find, are the roots of the first quadratic and the roots of the second quadratic right here, where s, t, u, and v are just those four numbers that we just worked out with that long convoluted method. Okay, so that was a lot. Now, I'm not even going to try and write down the entire general quartic formula because, I mean, we had to use the cubic formula in there. We had to use the quadratic formula quite a few times. I mean, writing it all down in one go would be, well, I wouldn't be able to fit it all on the page and have you still be able to read it. So there's not really any point in trying to do that. But at least in theory, you could now solve any quartic that was ever presented to you. Now, if you're ever given a quartic and you don't know how to solve it, should you try and use Ferrari's method? Probably not, because it's just so ridiculously impractical. If there are nice solutions that you're going to end up finding, well, guessing and checking would probably just be a better way to find them anyway than everything we just did. And if the solutions aren't nice and there's some horrible nested radical expressions, then you'd be better off just using a numerical approximation anyway for any practical purposes. The true value in the quartic and cubic formulas is not in being able to solve any quartic or cubic equation because, as we've seen, using them is actually highly, highly impractical. The value is more so in just knowing that it's possible and knowing that we're smart enough to figure out a way to do it. So next time that you're faced with a difficult quartic or cubic equation, you probably shouldn't use Ferrari's method or the cubic formula to solve it, but at least you know that now, at least in theory, you could. Thanks for watching. See you next time.